Welcome to Comic Culture. I'm Terrence Dollard, a professor in the Department of Mass Communication at UNC Pembroke. My guest today is Robert Chambers, an independent comic writer. Now, most people think of comic books as superhero stories, but that couldn't be further from the truth. Like novels or films, comic books can tell stories in any genre. There have been successful romance, true crime, horror, and sci-fi comics, just to name a few examples. While blockbuster films like The Dark Knight and The Avengers are the obvious examples of comics turned into feature films, other non-traditional comics have been adapted as well. Scott Pilgrim Saves the World, Red, The Road to Perdition, A History of Violence, Sin City, 300, and the list continues. Uh, Robert, how would you describe your style of writing? Uh, well, I, I try to... Uh... I try to juxtapose uh, uh, brutality. I don't want to use shock, schlock stuff, but uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm from a darker place anyway. So I, I try to uh, put this that dark portion into something that's that's also like either beautiful or poetic in some way. That's my at least my goal. Mm -hmm. You know, being inspired by people like H.P. Lovecraft as well as uh, uh, you know Alan Moore and Grant Morrison and all these other people. They uh, They've got a depth, but also a poetry to them that I, that I, I want to emulate if possible. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things that I notice um, in your books is that you have characters who are in just terrible situations. There's a lot of violence going on, and yet there seems to be reluctance on their part to be a participant. Um, so is that something that, that has come from your personal experience? Uh, we always hear, you know, writers write what they know. That's a good question. Um, and I'm just wondering, uh, you, you mentioned earlier that you were um, in the Marines, and uh, I'm just wondering if that influenced the way that you approach characters and stories. Fundamentally. It, well done. <laughs> That's impressive. Um, yeah, I think, I, think uh, uh, I do write a lot of dark stuff. Um, yeah, I've, I wrote a romantic comedy, and even then it was like a dark <laughs> romantic comedy. There's nothing I can do about it. But uh, uh, I think it's mostly just warnings. It's not that I'm trying to be mean or cruel or any of that. It's more, I'm, I'm just trying to, to make people ready for the worst. Um, so it's not intentionally, and, and of course, uh, uh, if you have such a, 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 a dichotomy relationship um, between, you know, uh, uh, violence and, uh, uh, yeah, like graphic violence and, uh, uh, excuse me, if you have uh, a dark portion to it if it is graphic and violent and and then you also have like a poetry and a beauty and a purity to it it kind of emphasizes both portions right you know mm -hmm. uh, um, and I think that's just kind of the the, the niche that I've found but uh, hopefully I'll be able and, and I, I try to work in subtlety as well um, because I don't want to be too heavy-handed about you know Here's black and here's white. Right. You know what I mean. The, you know the stories are in the gray area anyway. So, you know, well, most of life is probably in that gray area. Right. Um, absolutely. And, uh, Where people can empathize. Absolutely. But you still want it to be poignant enough uh, uh, to get uh, to get the point, the uh, the plot across. You know what I mean. I would mm -hmm. rather. Uh, that's why, like everything that I write has kind of a slap in the face ending. You know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Or uh, like I want it to be poignant enough to stick with someone. Right, yeah. that's, that's one of the things when I was reading through your, your books, uh, the story takes us in one direction, and then there's uh, usually something that happens at the end that takes us as a reader by surprise. Um, and I think that's it's a, a great way to keep us engaged once that last page is turned, uh, because we're still thinking about it. And I guess that's for any writer, that's the goal is to have the audience remember it and think about it, and, and you know the characters resonate more as characters rather than just, you know, okay, now that I'm done, let's go bring this back to the library. Mm. Not that that's a question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, uh, that's, that's an attempt that, that I do. I think uh, uh, a lot of the time when I'm doing that, I, I feel as though I'm leading somebody along in a conversation, kind of like, all right, so you know this and this and this and this, right? Knowing that it's going to be entirely different by the time I'm done. Right. Um, because uh, uh, if it's... If you know it if, it, if it's if it's tropes, if it's just the same uh, uh, formulaic stuff again and again and again, no one's going to remember it. No one's going to care. If uh, uh, if I'm writing something 
that seems uh, uh, like it's dark, it might very well have a happy ending, um, or it might have an even darker ending, but it's not going to be the same the entire time. Um, that's just, that's a lack of dynamics that, uh, it's lazy, I think, and mm -hmm. uh, it lacks passion. And if you're not, if you're not tearing up at the points where you want people to tear up, you're not doing it right. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, it's interesting because um, on this show, I've had the opportunity to speak to um, people who have a, a monthly deadline. And one of the things they, they say is either they know everything ahead of time mm. or they have no idea what's going to happen. Um, so when you're writing, are you, are you aware of where you want to go or do you just sort of sit down at the, the typewriter, not that anyone uses a typewriter anymore, and just see what happens? I, uh, uh, it's funny, a lot of the time I start with the ending. I start with the idea of the point that I'm trying to reinforce, and uh, you know, there's, you know, it, it's got to be a, a, a poignant twist uh, uh, for whatever reason. And then, oftentimes, I'll retrograde. the uh, uh, The thing, the the biggest issue that I have when it comes to writing, a, you know, something of of a larger substance is uh, the the secondary plot. Mm -hmm. That's always something that I kind of have to like figure out and, and weave into it. But a lot of the time, I start off at the beginning. And then, you know, figure out the characters and how to reinforce this. Excuse me, I start at the ending and, and, and right. find out how to reinforce how we're going to get to that place. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That's, uh, it's sort of what Margaret Mitchell did with Gone with the Wind. Wrote the last page first and then said, well, how do I get here? Yeah, I knew that. <laughs> I knew now, that it's too. interesting. <laughs> um, you, you mentioned a secondary plot. And that's something that, as, uh, as television viewers, we're used to. I mean, even on a show like Family Matters, sure. when when um, Urkel is trying to take out uh, Laura to the, the big dance or something, there's always that secondary story where Carl and the other kids are putting together the house of cards. And you know at the end Urkel's going to walk in and knock it over, and then Carl's going to shoot him. Right. Uh, no, that, sorry, that's I just remember that thinking. episode. Um, but yeah, now the work that I've seen here, and I'm just going to hold a couple of these up, um, are these available uh, online, or is this something that we would find at our local comic shop? Um, well, uh, the local comic, uh, comic book shops in Columbia, uh, you can also get them at the uh, Piensa Art Company, P-I-E-N-S-A uh, Art Company dot com. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, if, if they're not, if you don't find specific ones that are up there, uh, you can always email us. Our, our, uh, our contact information is there. So it's chambers at piensaartcompany.com if you're interested, and I can, uh, you know, mail them to you, or we'll, we can figure something out one way or another. Well, just getting back to what I was trying mm. to get to, <laughs> not that you interrupted me, I interrupted my, myself. But what I was going to say is that you have, um, like in this one, the Heroes of Santa Moreno. Mm. Um, I don't know exactly how many pages this is, but it's, it's like a short story. It's, it's all contained. And yet within this short story, um, you do have that secondary plot that's going on along with the main story that we're following along. So there's always, um, as they would say with Shakespeare, the drums of Fortinbras are always pounding, you know. Um, don't know what that means either. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but we do have this, the main story of this, uh, this convict who's being given a second chance. And we're also seeing, you know, his story through his son's eyes. Right. Um, and it's, it's really interesting the way you've done that. And um, what you've done, um, this is about 22 pages or so? Or I'm sorry? About 22 pages. Oh, that? No, that's, that's, that's eight pages. Eight pages. Well, it seems a lot longer well, I'm glad you in think a good so. way. Um, and what is, I think we talked about this before we started the taping, that this is very similar to a Sergio Leone uh, mm. spaghetti-style Western, you know, whether it's uh, Once Upon a Time in the Old West or The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. It has that sort of um, epicness to it, but it is you know, sh a short eight-page story. Uh, and you're able to engage with the character. So how do you uh, approach a, a story like this? Um, I think with, with any story, it's, it's very important that if it's not character or plot driven, that it shouldn't be there. Uh, there was somebody that told me at one point, if you're reading a script and you can skip 10 pages ahead and still know what's going on, just put it down. It's not worth reading. Um, so the idea uh, of that, like, uh, uh, makes it more dynamic. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I guess I was trying to do period pieces for the shorts just, just to, you know, stretch and find out what it is that I could do. And it's easier to get shorts drawn, you know what I mean? The uh, 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 Once a Marine a graphic novel that I'm, you know, hopefully going to be coming out with pretty soon, it's, it's going to take a, uh, 15 grand and uh, about a year and a half 
for the artist, mm -hmm. you know, for the artist alone. Um, for these, um, I didn't have to pay anywhere near as much. So right. they were easier to uh, uh, pump out. So you serve as sort of the, the producer, uh, you know, using the film analogy again, the, the person who comes up with the idea and comes up with the financing for it. And finds the people that are going to do it because I've got, uh, I've worked with several different people. These aren't, the, like I've got uh, uh, Sammy and Dre Lopez, which are all, who are also uh, part of the Pienza Art Company that, uh, that do fantastic stuff. But I've had to go, like uh, uh, Andre Araujo that did God Will Save Me in the first Odin book uh, lives in Portugal. Mm -hmm. um, I have uh, uh, other, like I've got a, a, a woman that uh, worked for Disney that, uh, uh, in, in Florida that did, uh, uh, what was the Hashishin? So it's, I just, I just want to get a shot of that. <laughs> bless you for it. Um, and yeah, Eric Darns uh, works in, uh, where is it? I can't even remember off the top of my head. But, uh, um, but he lives in uh, Georgia. So, we're the state of Georgia or the independent republic of Georgia? <laughs> Given that I was mentioning the Philippines earlier, I could see that. Uh, yeah, the state. Um, <laughs> but he's, uh, he's a fantastic colorist. Um, but you, it's, it's funny, as, as proud as I am um, to, I guess, have come as far as I have, as far as my writing is concerned, I've put as much, if not more, work into finding the people to do it. Um, Heavy Feather Falls, which was uh, uh, a book that was, you know, very proud of it, written in, all in haikus, broken up haikus, and every three pages, five panels, seven panels, five panels. Um, took me five and a half, six hours to write it. Mm -hmm. Took me three years to have it made. Okay. Well that's so, yeah, you got to be on people. You got you to, uh, uh, you know, make sure that uh, they're, they're willing and, and pumped to get the job done. Mm -hmm so that when you come with corrections to the thumbnails or the pencils or something like that, um, they're still willing to put up with it. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a fine line. It's a fine line. So, I mean, uh, beyond the creative drive to tell stories, you have to have uh, sort of a business sense. And is this something that you, uh, you studied in school or is this something that you just sort of learned as you go? Well, um, I've, I've always been raised with, uh, with the idea of, uh, um, you know, business and family, business and pleasure being entirely separate. Mm -hmm. um, that's one of the things about, uh, uh, if you're going to make it in the industry, there's so many people out there who are fantastic writers, they're fantastic artists, but they don't show up. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, that's, you know, like some of the, uh, uh, like so many artists, it's, it's a, a, a large issue for them to actually sell their work. That's not where their interest is. My interest isn't to sell either. I'm not really looking to make much money. I'm just looking to have the stories out. Right. But if you're going to do it, sometimes you got to, uh, sometimes you just got to chew on that, on that, on the stuff that you don't really want to. Right. So sometimes you have to do work that you don't want to right. do work that you do want. Sure. Sometimes you have to eat a bowl of cherry pits. You know what I mean? <laughs> Absolutely. Sure. <laughs> um, now, you mentioned um, your new uh, graphic novel. Mm. Um, what, what is that about? Um, it's called Once a Marine. And uh, it basically, it spans uh, about 65 years. Um, originally, I started, uh, I, I started out, I already knew the story. It was mine. You know what I mean? So it wasn't difficult for me to, uh, uh, to know the linear progression of the thing. Um, and I pretty much knew what the, uh, uh, what the arc was going to be before I started. Um, I had a vague notion, a vague idea of it. But in order for me to actually put pen to paper when it came to the very first page, um, I had to understand what it was that made me join the Marine Corps, which had to do with you know, how I was raised. And to, to reinforce that, I showed how the people that raised me were raised so that they could see that I'm not simply uh, uh, pointing out any, anyone, anyone's shortcomings, mm -hmm. how you know, we are all in this together fundamentally one way, shape, form, or another, but that uh, uh, we are the products of the way that we're raised. 
And that eventually took me to Afghanistan a couple of times. And then once I got out, it wasn't, uh, it just, I don't know, the, the entire experience wasn't what you would think. You know, it's not, uh, uh, it's not a story of, of heroism, it's more a story of, uh, uh, I tell people it, it, it's like I'm at the starting line and three quarters of the way through I'm just sprinting as fast as I can, I'm at speed and then I just trip and fall. And the rest of it's me just kind of like, you know, like sliding across right. the gravel and then eventually hopefully picking myself back up, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? But it's, uh, uh, you know, it's a pretty rough ride, and, and it's also extraordinarily honest. Mm -hmm. Very, very honest. So, yeah. And, and going back to what I was mentioning in the beginning about um, our perception, of America's perception of, of comics being, you know, capes and tights, <laughs> this is a, a deeply personal story that you're telling. And you're just choosing to tell it in this sequential art format we call comics. Um, why wouldn't you consider just turning that into a screenplay? Well, um, I've written a few screenplays, a few feature-length screenplays, and I'm very proud of them. Um, but finding the, you know, the equipment, the people to work with them, the locations, having all the forms signed off, uh, uh, getting the money for all of these things is uh, uh, next to impossible. <laughs> it's, it's, it's very difficult especially considering most of the time when you make a movie and you get money from other people, it's with the understanding they're probably not going to get it back. Right. You know what I mean? Like with a, with a publisher, um, you only have to work with the artist and the writer. You know what I mean? And the agent, of course, and uh, you know, whoever else is involved, but there's not anywhere near as many people. Um, and i got to be honest, I've, I've read... I, I, I write prose from time to time, and I, I write short stories from time to time, but uh, the idea, I'm, I'm just not anywhere near as familiar with uh, writing uh, uh, a full novel. To be entirely honest, I'm actually uh, 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 partially dyslexic, so it takes me a long time to read things, mm -hmm. but if I have it set up in pages and panels, I can just go right back to it. It's not a big deal. You know, chapters, pages, panels, it's not difficult for me to find. Mm -hmm. So I don't see a book being, uh, uh, you know, in my near future, and uh, it would be far too hard to get it made if it was a movie. Mm -hmm. So the only way I could have it seen, I would, you know, would be through uh, graphic novel form. And, and you said that this, uh, the story that you've written is about 300 pages? Well, Odin is, oh, uh, Odin is 300 pages. Oh, uh, the other one's gonna be roughly two. Okay, uh, and if we were trying to figure out, um, you know, from a movie point of view, how long that would be in the movie that might be longer than the average audience is willing to sit down. Right. Um, I mean, even as films seem to be getting longer and longer, mm. in the, the 1980s, the average movie was, you know, two uh, hours for a drama, an hour and a half for a comedy. Now, if you don't sit in the movie theater for three hours, you feel cheated. Um, but even so, I mean, it, it does seem like this is a format that lets you tell the story the way you want to tell Absolutely. it. Absolutely. It's nice because um, there are some references to, uh, that people might need to look up. Um, there's, uh, uh, you know, you can always put it down and go back to it later. Um, and with, uh, with this, with, with comic books, there's a way of, of pacing out the, uh, the dialogue, the captions, the, uh, the uh, action in the panels to where you can pretty much time it in the same way a director might time something that he was shooting. So if you want something paced out and slower and longer, you can do that. Um, whereas if it's a book, it's just kind of, they read at their own pace and, and they don't really experience it the same way, mm -hmm. you know. Well, speaking of pacing, when you are writing a, a script, are you following the, the full script method where you're, you know, panel one, page one, panel one, this happens, page two, or do you follow sort of the, the Marvel style where you give a, a, you know, a rougher description of what happens? Sure, sure. Um, I, I actually do it panel by panel. I do the Alan Moore thing rather than the Grant Morrison thing. Mm -hmm. Alan Moore is, is very specific about everything that he needs in the panel. He's actually a lot more descriptive because I've had other friends of mine that, that are in the industry that told me that there were artists. They were like, I hate it when they give me too many directions. It's supposed to be a collaborative effort, you know. Um, so originally I started writing it with uh, as few 
uh, uh, directions as possible. But then I had other people complaining about it, and there were, uh, uh, um, you know, we uh, there were problems with uh, getting the thumbnails done and stuff like that. So, um, you know, now I'm I'm as descriptive as I need to be past that. They can use any artistic license that they want. Mm -hmm. But it's it's every panel needs to look like this. I don't originally. It was like, all right, I need four panels, horizontal and stacked. Panel one looks like this, panel two, panel three, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Now I just say panel one, panel two, panel three, and let the artists do their own thing, you know, preferably using people that do bleed outs and stuff like right. that, you know, who, who really do um, add their own uh, uh, bent to the, uh, to the story itself. And it sounds to me like you're willing to collaborate. So if, <laughs> if an artist is looking at the script and has, you know, a suggestion that they feel would help the story along visually, uh, because of course when we read comics we are looking at the picture while we're reading the, sure. the balloons. Um, is that something that you're, you're open to, if it will help the story? Well that's uh, uh, up until a point, um, excuse me, when it comes to improving the story, absolutely. If it helps, if they add something to it, I'm like, that's brilliant, thank you so much for, for bringing this up. Um, but if they're insistent on doing something that's not appropriate, that's actually why I prefer to pay them. You know <laughs> what I mean? So I could be like, yeah, yeah, I know you feel this way, but do it like this. Right. You know what I mean? Because I, I, uh, uh, I don't know, maybe I'm a little bit, I've worked with too many people that have, that have messed up uh, the vision that I was going for. Um, a lot of, I mean, you can tell that in movies. We were talking earlier about uh, uh, cowboys and uh, aliens. Mm -hmm. um, they, uh, uh, the, the problem with that movie was that there were too many people trying to put an input. There was no singular vision. Right. You know what I mean? There's, I mean, and that's, that's the thing about Sergio Leone and, and Kurosawa and stuff like that. There is an epic vision, and everybody follows that. You know, right. Quentin Tarantino. Right, you know right. I mean? where, where you have one person who actually has a creative drive rather right. than and everybody, a group of people just looking to make as much money as possible. Right, and, and we're talking about people that are, uh, uh, that are all working in tandem to, to have this one idea fully formed rather than, you know... Uh, uh, Maybe I want the lighting to be this way, or maybe I want the person to be wearing this. You know what I mean? It's it's much better if uh, if you have a full and complete story that's uninterrupted by other people's uh, opinions. And if it's not good, not opinions, but uh, uh, um, other people's want to go a little bit further than um, what is necessary. You know, mm -hmm. there's a uh, uh, it's as it's as important as uh, uh, you know spacing in stories. Miles Davis was saying, you know, it's as important to know when not to play as when to play. Right. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, in order to get that, that vision, in order to make it a nice, tight diamond of a story, a lot of the time you have to, uh, you kind of have to put your foot down. Mm -hmm. You have to say, this is, this is the way I'm looking at it. This is the way you're going to do it. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? But, uh, um, if I'm talking with someone and they're telling me uh, a way that I can improve a story, they have my rapt attention to the point where like, I've uh, you know, stumbled into stuff while I was talking with people trying to write down what they were <laughs> saying on my phone, you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. if anybody, like I would bark at people if, uh, if anyone interrupted me while I was trying to, to remember this one thing, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So, not actually bark, you get the <laughs> idea. I talk at them. Right, you, I, know. I, you could be part dog, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I know. Nothing wrong with that. Jerry's still out, we'll figure it out. <laughs> but, but, but yeah, I can be, uh, it can be trying on, it has been trying on a couple of artists before, but um, they agreed in the end that it made more sense the way I was doing it, and uh, other artists as well were you know, in agreement as, you know, mm -hmm. so. There has to be someone at the helm that has uh, the, the idea, the dream of what it's going to be, and they can't be too much of a pushover. Otherwise, you'll just get some convoluted mess. Mm -hmm. you know? Now, you had mentioned uh, before we started uh, that you had done some work for uh, DC and Marvel, uh, well, or, or scripts for characters from DC and Marvel. And I was wondering, is, is that something that you had uh, Submitted to them because I mean that's an there environment. There are four submissions. Four submissions, okay. Right. Because that's something where 
you know, you're talking about uh, writing your own comic and right. creating it the way that you want. And the two big publishers, Marvel and DC, are uh, they're always looking at a product rather than what's actually being put on the page. So I was wondering if you had any experience working with uh, a publisher where they are telling you what they're looking for. Um, I haven't. Uh, I mean, I've done, I've worked with plenty of people that wanted me to do something for them, but not major publishers mm -hmm. doing that. No, the, uh, uh, um, that's why we're doing these uh, sample portions, basically fan fiction, more or less, in order to uh, uh, show the people at DC and show the people at Marvel that uh, these artists and this writer are capable of doing these things. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, Dre and Sammy had actually been tapped by Marvel before, but uh, they, they felt as though they wanted to uh, kind of hone their skills a little bit more. Mm -hmm. So they're ready, and uh, so yeah. Now I've got the, the uh, Batman short and the uh, Gambit short. Funny thing about the Gambit short, I actually wrote one because I wrote the, the, uh, the Batman silent uh, uh, short put to John Don's No Man is an Island, mm -hmm. which I told you about before. I also did, uh, did one with Gambit, I'm very proud of, put to uh, another silent one put to Invictus, um, which is another favorite poem of mine. Um, and I figured, you know, I could just go along with that sort of uh, uh, style for a little bit. And yeah, all humility aside, I, I thought it was a great story. And so did the artist that was asking me to do it. But it wasn't Gambit. Right. It was just, you know, it was Gambit's story, it was his background, and it went along with what drove him fundamentally at his very base. But Gambit's character is not about, you know, a dark, deep-seated whatever. It's about being coy and clever and, mm -hmm. you know, kind of being a charming... Uh, Rogue, Rogue, basically. Yeah, basically. Well, <laughs> Funny I, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, uh, uh, but we have run out of time. If you could believe our half an hour has just flown by. Oh. Uh, we've been speaking with Robert Chambers. Uh, your company, again, is the... Pienza. Pienza Art Company. That's, That's the correct. website uh, where people can find out more information about the books you've written. Uh, I recommend The Heroes of Santa Moreno, Santa Moreno and um, Odin. And uh, we appreciate you watching Comic Culture. We'll see you again next time.